Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Artist Talk Series for our current exhibition, Shift, Thinking Globally, Acting Locally. The Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery is thrilled to present Lauren Davies, one of our exhibiting artists. As always, if you have any questions along the way, please drop them into the comments or chat, and we'll be sure to pick them up during the Q&A portion of the hour. Now to you, Lauren. Thank you, Kat, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joined in today at lunchtime. I hope you brought your own sandwiches. Um, first, I'd really like to um, thank the Ohio Arts Council. Um, they have been very supportive of my work for the time that I've lived in Ohio. And, uh, and it's great to be part of this exhibition. Really want to thank the staff at the Rife Gallery, Kat uh, Sheridan and Amy Wisman and certainly our wonderful curator who's not with us today, um, Maria Seda Reeder. So uh, many thanks to Maria and also all of the really terrific artists in the exhibition. And, um, and here we go. I think. <laughs> um, so talking about my work, um, really takes me back to where I, I came from, which is um, Pittsburgh. I wasn't born there, but I grew up in Pittsburgh and um, I eventually left there. But when I think back to Pittsburgh and growing up there, I really think back um, a lot on the film, The Deer Hunter. Um, these, um, I think three of these images, not the Merry Christmas image, but the other three images are actually from the film, The Deer Hunter. And although I did not grow up in a neighborhood that it looked exactly like that, I felt um, growing up in Pittsburgh and the Rust Belt very much looked like this. And um, ironically, when I moved to Cleveland, I realized how much of the, of the Deer Hunter was actually filmed in Cleveland and not in Pittsburgh. Um, these are further images of Pittsburgh, um, which is, uh, it's not that far from Cleveland, but it is really nothing like Cleveland. I mean, there's these incredible hillsides with all of these little small houses kind of just hanging onto the hillside. And uh, the image on the right, that might have been from like the early 60s. The pollution was so terrible. I mean, we did not live downtown, but um, you know, I think it was better out where we lived, but um, the pollution was legendary. So this image um, on the right is shot in the middle of the day in Pittsburgh. Um, my mother used to tell us a story all the time about uh, when our father would go off to work every day that he would leave wearing a white shirt and that he would carry a second shirt that he changed into at lunchtime because shirt number one was gray by lunchtime. Um, and another story I kind of remember my mom telling <laughs> many times was this story about Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright worked um, on a number of projects for the Kaufman family, such as Falling Waters that is um, mm, driving distance. I can't remember, it's like an hour, an hour and a half away from Pittsburgh. So I guess the officials of Pittsburgh had Frank Lloyd Wright come into the city, go to the top of the tallest building and make recommendations. And his recommendation was abandon it <laughs> and start over. So, um, so much for Pittsburgh. But um, one of the, I mean, there certainly were some very good things about growing up uh, in Pittsburgh, but I would say the best for me was uh, when I was, I think I was in junior high school, um, the Carnegie Museum had been running a program for a very long time that brought like a couple of kids from each public school um, to the museum every Saturday to take these um, art classes. So I started art classes when I, I I was probably like 13 or 14. And, uh, you know, with all of these other kids, we would go to the museum, have a lecture, we had homework, and then we would be taken into the museum to work on, um, you know, sketching and drawing and making these little paintings with these like little tiny Dixie cups of like tempera paint on like paper. So I spent a lot of time at that museum, which was just, um, just such an important experience for me. And it was also the experience of like going to the other side of town, seeing how other people lived, um, just getting that whole feeling of being in a, in a museum that was, um, was an art museum with, you know, a really great collection. The Carnegie International was on view. I can't remember if that's a biennial or a triennial, but that was a chance for me as a kid to, to see, you know, contemporary art. 
besides the collection at the museum, but uh, the Carnegie is also a natural history museum. So the two images that are there of the dinosaur collection, and along with these amazing dioramas. So um, this particular one on the right of this lion attacking um, a man on a camel was just, I mean, so riveting and horrifying and dark and amazing. And to spend a lot of time as a kid sitting in front of these dioramas, drawing them, um, it was just a really great experience. Uh, yeah, very thankful for that. Um, so when I um, was ready to go off to school, I decided to move almost as far away from Pittsburgh as possible, which was going to San Francisco. So um, I moved to San Francisco to go to school. So I did go to the San Francisco Art Institute. I went um, to undergraduate school and got a BFA in painting and then liked it so much, the school, but also just living in San Francisco and the life that I had built up there and that I decided to stay for an MFA program there and I got an MFA in sculpture. So this was like a really just crazy, great, amazing experience to be a young person, to go to the other side of the country where there was just all this wild creative alternative stuff going on and to go to this like super radical alternative school. I think by the time I was finishing my MFA, it was like the kind of beginning of the punk era. And uh, it, it was a great experience. I, you know, art school is such a different thing now. School in general is such a different thing. But uh, I think going to that kind of school really did instill some lifelong values in my perception of being an artist and making art that it's not about money. It's not about saleability. It's really about experimenting. It's really about finding your voice, finding your personal niche. So again, I'll always be happy that I, I went to school there. Whoops, yep, here we go. So um, after I got out of school, I ended up doing quite a you know a number of different jobs as everybody who gets out of art school does. But um, I finally landed in a really great niche for me. And um, I started working in the art world. I worked in the nonprofit part of the art world. I worked at a residency center um, in Berkeley that was primarily focused on, it was uh, print media, printmaking, um, that had evolved into like to digital photography. There was a lot of digital work, photo work, a lot of like hybrid work. Um, there was video. And over time, I eventually became the gallery director and the curator, which was just a great experience for me. I mean, by this time, I, you know, I wasn't a kid. Um, you know, I was pretty established in my own work, but this experience brought so much to my life. I mean, it, as an artist, I mean, and as a person, I met really great people. And um, so these um, images here are, um, represent some of the shows that I curated. So um, the image up at the far left is by a really wonderful artist named Ben Don. Um, Ben's a pretty well-known photographer. He, um, I think he might be teaching at Stanford now. He lives in the Bay Area. But um, the show, the top three images, um, is called Systems of Collecting. I've been, really interested in collections, like going back to that time I was showing earlier of going um, to art school, like at the, at the Carnegie and spending a lot of time looking at collections, um, you know, from natural history collections, um, they say like the image in the middle, that work is by um, Matthew Mullins. It's a beautiful watercolor of an insect collection. And I think that work is like, I think it's like three by four feet. It's a huge watercolor. Um, Matt really made some amazing work for the show. Like when you look at the um, image over on the right side, those three large works, you get a sense of the scale of those as watercolors. Um, Ben's work um, is on that gray wall in the back. So these um, daguerreotypes, um, they were uh, photographed at, um, the Genocide Museum in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, where the uh, Khmer Rouge um, documented, basically collected images of everybody that they killed. Um, and it was just sort of really weird, obsessive, like, you know, 
like the woman on the image with the number 21 tag on her, that was, um, you know, one of the genocide portraits. So um, Bin Don did these really beautiful daguerreotype um, photographs from the Genocide Museum. And then the um, image in the foreground um, of, of the collection is from an artist named Mary Andrews. So we basically, um, just took Mary's studio and put it in the middle of the gallery. She just had an amazing collection of uh, just everything you could imagine, like rocks and feathers and sticks and string. Um, the images at the bottom um, the, about Siege, that was um, an exhibition of photo-based works about um, sort of basically how um, home had become a fortress. So the image on the on the card was when um, in California, developers were moving out into what had been like agricultural lands and just buying up these huge chunks of land and building these, you know, these kind of like mini mansions and then money ran out and water was running out and nobody was buying these houses. So here's a completely, you know, built finished house with nothing around it. Um, the image in the middle um, it was from that same exhibition of um, houses that had just been completely overtaken by vegetation. Uh, the uh, image on the lower right is from Helen and Newton Harrison, um, who did uh, so much really important work that was way ahead of its time about um, uh, climate change. And it was um, about sea, the sea rising around Great Britain. Um, I think the show was called, um, I can't remember, but something with a, a word force majeure in the title, which is, uh, I think it's a term that's often used even by the airlines, meaning like act of God. Um, you know, so uh, that's a sample of some of the work that went on at the gallery that was uh, really great to be part of. So then over time, this happened. Um, and I love, or don't love, but I think this combination of images really speaks to what San Francisco and the Bay Area sadly became this completely um, separate reality. So of like, you know, on the left, Silicon Valley, you know, the tech industry, um, it just really changed everything. It really changed life. Um, you know, for everyone, you know, for a lot of people, I'm sure it made their life great and they made a ton of money. Um, for a lot of people, like on the image on the right hand side, you just truly cannot imagine how many people are homeless in the Bay Area, you know, just, I mean, really living on the sidewalk, living in their cars, living in these tents, like living under the freeway. Every time I go back, it's like I often stay with a friend who lives over in the Berkeley Hills and I'm, you know, over on the other side of the bay. And it's like, every time I go there, it's like people are living further and further out from San Francisco, living under the, living under the freeway. So um, I ended up being one of those people that left. A lot of people left, especially a lot of artists left. A lot of artists, you know, moved up to um, Portland, Seattle, you know, Northern California, some went to Los Angeles. I went to the Rust Belt, I came, I came to Cleveland. So, but before I got to Cleveland, um, which was a really big life decision to leave California. I mean, at that point, I think I'd lived there for like 35 years. So uh, it, was, it was very sad to leave, but it seemed like the best thing to do. But before I arrived in Cleveland, um, I had some residencies and I went to, um, Santa Fe. So I went to, this is an image of the beautiful Santa Fe Art Institute, which I think with going there was um, a real turning point for me and the work I was doing. I, I mean, I had been at the job I showed earlier with a gallery at that residency center. I'd worked there for like a dozen years and um, wasn't really traveling that much, didn't really do that. I mean, I did some residencies, but you know, when you have a job, it's hard to sometimes get away and do your own thing. But um, I took a break between leaving San Francisco and coming to Cleveland and uh, being in Santa Fe really and being in a new studio, being in a different setting, um, it really changed my work, it really changed my thinking. Oops, excuse me, let me go back to this for just one second. But um, I think when I was there in Santa Fe, I actually ordered my first kind of like serious camera. 
and I started getting out of the studio and, uh, you know, started thinking less about just sitting in a room making objects and started, um, you know, driving around at a car, which was great when I was there. So I drove around a lot, looked at a lot of things, um, just started really thinking differently about what I was going to do next. So I did arrive in Cleveland and um, I, my family lives here, although um, I didn't grow up here, as I said, I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, but I really, you know, when I arrived here, I didn't know anybody except my family. I didn't know anybody in the art world. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I actually even thought maybe I was just done with being an artist and I was going to, reinvent myself into something else that I couldn't even imagine what that was going to be. But being here, I started driving around a lot and um, sort of that, um, you know, visiting where I'd grown up and just, I don't know, thinking about my childhood, where I'd come from um, and thinking about how much the world had changed. Like I said, I'd been gone for like 35 years and I started thinking a lot about how much as we all think about this, the economy impacts how we live. And to these two images are actually from Detroit. So I started driving around to these various Rust Belt cities and looking at um, what had happened to the economy, you know, in these different places, how it had affected more people than I can even imagine affected the communities. And I thought a lot about feeling very pressured to have left San Francisco. Um, you know, like a lot of people did really because of the economy. But, you know, it was also like quality of life, just expenses, traffic, just unbelievable traffic. I was spending like two hours a day um, just to drive round trip to Berkeley from San Francisco. So I, um, you know, really started thinking a lot about the Rust Belt. And um, at this point had become more immersed in, um, you know, photography, I never saw myself as a photo photographer. I never saw myself as like printing these images um, or showing them as photographs. But it was, um, I could say almost more kind of like a research, um, you know, project that I didn't really know what I was going to do with. Um, so a lot of weekends, I would drive around to these different places. Like this image on the left is Youngstown. Ohio that I remember being a kid like Youngstown was always the halfway place between Pittsburgh and Cleveland um, you know when I would see it from the highway you know sitting in the back seat of the car when I was a little kid but no, I don't know if we ever even drove into Youngstown so Youngstown became one of my really favorite places to go and photograph um, the image on the right hand side is um, in Cleveland, kind of a further out part of Cleveland. This is the Randall Park Mall. So at one point, um, the Randall Park Mall was the biggest mall in the United States. I guess a lot of malls can claim that for a minute. Um, but by the time I moved here, the mall had long since gone out of business. And it's very interesting the way in which malls go out of business. Um, and then it sat empty for maybe like 10 or 15 years. So I think the first winter I was living here, I read about how they were um, tearing it down. So I went out there and started photographing um, this demolition uh, process of tearing down this huge mall. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about artists who really inspire me. And I think um, for all of us, uh, whether we're artists, actually making work or, you know, whoever we might be in life, I think we find inspiration from all kinds of situations and people um, around us and they change over time. What inspired me when I was in, like say graduate school is very different than what inspires me now, but I'll show images of three different artists that I, um, right now I think a lot about their work. So this is Mark Bradford, um, Mark Bradford, um, is like internationally known artist um, from Los Angeles. He uh, represented the US at the Venice Biennale several years ago. Um, so I was in um, Washington DC and his show Pickett's Charge was at the Hirshhorn 
and it's just, I mean, to me, it was just like one of the best things I'd ever seen. If you've ever been to the Hirshhorn, it's a big circular, um, not like the Guggenheim exactly, but somewhat along those lines where you can't see everything all at once. It's really, you know, you really have to walk through this whole circular um, exhibition. So he, so Mark Bradford, um, you know, grew up in Los Angeles is a gay black man who worked in his mother's um, hair salon. And uh, I don't think he had any particular vision of becoming an artist, but he eventually started working with these, um, I'm not sure what they're called. I think they might be called end papers that they you know, use in a salon for like doing perms or something like that. He started making things from this kind of layered up paper, which you can see like all of these years later, now that he's very well known, he's still working with an aspect of that layered up paper. I think when he um, might've been in school or graduate school or right after graduate school, he was using um, these like torn up like um, signs from, um, I can't remember what part of LA he lived in, um, but they were like advertisements for the, you know, things like houses for sale or products and black community that he lived in and started layering up and, and building things in that way where they are, um, these just amazing collages that I think are, um, really hit that midpoint of being, uh, personal and political. Um, this is another artist I really like, um, Kyle Meyer. Um, Kyle's work, um, you know, is very different than Mark Bradford's, but I would say um, it's the same aspect of his work that really um, I think is wonderful, that it's, um, it's very personal and it's political. Um, Kyle is um, a gay artist from New York who um, ended up on a project where he went to Swaziland and in Swaziland being gay is punishable by death. <laughs> um, and so being in a gay community is a highly kind of dangerous, secretive, under the radar kind of life. So he met with these different men in the community and um, I guess Swaziland is very well known for its fabrics. And he got these fabrics at the market and worked with each of these men to create um, a beautiful portrait of um, these men as they would like to be seen in these like headdresses made from this, um, this fabric in Swaziland. So Kyle then does some combination of printing these portraits and then slicing them in some way and then weaving the actual fabric that's in the portrait through um, the work. So I saw his work in New York a couple years ago and just thought it was amazing. And then um, I met Kyle, um, I think it was earlier this year, we were in a show together at a transformer station. So that was really great. So again, Kyle's work, love that personal and political and media material experimentation. And uh, here's the third of the three artists. This is Marie Watt. Um, I saw Marie Watt's work in somewhere, it was either in Seattle or um, Portland. She lives, I believe in Portland. She's a member of the Seneca Nation. She works exclusively in textiles. A lot of her um, textile work has to do with blankets that were very important in the, you know, uh, Native American culture, the trading of blankets, the collecting of blankets. And, um, and I think she works often in these community-based projects um, with people working with the blankets and with fabrics. And similar um, in a way to um, Kyle Meyer and Mark Bradford of taking um, a material that's very important uh, to each of these artists and finding a way that kind of like elevates it to a larger political yet personal way of engaging with the community. And I think they're really phenomenally beautiful, smart, engaging works. So that's Marie Watt. So those are three people right now I, I really look to and um, with great admiration. So um, back to um, jumping back in time. This was the last bit of work that I uh, was doing when I still lived in San Francisco. And I um, 
you know, going back again to talking about my experience of, uh, you know, going to you know school when I was a kid at the Carnegie Museum, I was very interested in um, in museums and the way museums come together, and um, particularly like really oddball like museums that are almost like I, I had some phrase I used to do like. Um, it was something like museums that look like they've been put together by a PTA committee where there's it's just kind of ad hoc and let's put this in and this is important and um, so I did a lot of travels around and uh, and looked at odd museums like the um, the piece on the left was um, from a trip that I went on to Newfoundland and I really wanted to see like that um, that image on you know that looks like it's uh, embroidered actually is uh, a photograph or a scan I took of uh, the image logo for this town where you can see that where there's these like really cool little salt box houses in the summer with um, uh, icebergs coming down. Um, I think they come on, I think it's the Labrador current or it's called Iceberg Alley, something like that. And I got there, of course, there were no icebergs to be seen, but I did uh, find this really crazy little, like one of these kind of PTA committee uh, museums uh, and, and kind of created an entire exhibition around that, that thinking about just making a museum yourself. Uh, the image on the right, um, I, uh, bought this beautiful old map. Um, I'm not even sure what year it was from um, in a flea market in France that was this kind of crumbling map that was kind of some combination of uh, linen and paper and like almost every single country in Africa had a different name back then. So I did a, a project um, that again was kind of making like a little, my own version of a museum that, um, it's called Dominion was the name of the show. Um, a lot about all of the changes and around colonization, um, you know, of people, of animals, of what had happened to the, um, you know, the ice fields on Kilimanjaro. Um, so it was vaguely related to the Newfoundland um, related show, which was called When Hell Freezes Over. So I, you know, I'd been thinking a lot about, um, you know, climate change and global, you know, environmental issues. Um, so jumping around again, this is um, the images that I started working on when I was in um, Santa Fe in New Mexico. Like I, I was talking about getting a camera and going out and starting to really take pictures for the first time. I mean, the images that I uh, showed a second ago of um, the Newfoundland show and of the Africa show, those were little pictures I had taken of things that I had collected. And this was a really big jump for me to be out walking around with a camera looking at things. So um, the images here, like say the image um, on the left um, that's blue it was a, uh, a construction site that was right near the Santa Fe Art Institute that was just so utterly bizarre. There was just such a weird conglomeration of, of materials and things stacked up. And, you know, like anybody who's a photographer is always raving about going to, um, to New Mexico, the light's so amazing. And it was like, no kidding, the light is really amazing. And it does make things in the images just seem kind of phenomenal. So I, um, and the thing on the right was like a weird, just painted purple rock that was in the pile of a bunch of other rocks. So when I got to Cleveland, I started working with these images and turning them into, into like photo sculptures that was in a way almost like a, uh, a sort of, um, I don't know, what would you say, like a collaboration with an unknown entity um, of, you know, like say the, the image on the left, um, that, that box, that crate made out of, um, you know, that, that weirdly fabricated wood, I think it's called OSB board, um, was sitting on a blue tarp. So part of the tarp um, is actually a photograph and part of what's sewn around the edge is a real tarp. So it's a very kind of like weird um, trompe l'oeil optical illusion kind of thing. And the one on the right is just a super weird random combination of um, image and, uh, and materials. 
same for this. Um, this is like a small sculpture I made. It's like of a photograph I took um, when I was in Santa Fe, this weird um, shadowy kind of thing, and then made an object that corresponded to that. And it was called trying to understand a shadow. Um, and then I, I'm going to move on to the work that um, is more current, that's like part of the um, exhibition, part of the work in the exhibition shift. I, um, when I was working on those weird fabric, you know, um, photograph material experimentations, I discovered I could get these images um, that I was taking around in the Rust Belt woven. So these are not printed, they're actually woven. So if you look, you know, at the image on the right hand side of my hand holding some of these threads, that's a close up of what these look like. So um, you can get photographs woven and you can dismantle them and you can do all kinds of things with these woven photographs. So um, I started thinking a lot about meshing um, an image um, with a process. So these images are you know, all of these Rust Belt images that I, I drove around and took, um, you know, in this area. So this particular image is in Youngstown and thinking about the economy and about um, how much manufacturing has changed. Um, so I actually was getting these images, these woven images uh, made at um, Walmart. So which um, is like the uh, manufacturer of today. So I very specifically wanted to use Walmart. I mean, I stumbled into it, but then it really became part of the process of making um, images of uh, previous manufacturing processes with the manufacturing process of today. So I get the image and, you know, I have sort of an idea of what I want to do with it. It's like I, when you look at this um, image of the top of this building collapsing, the entire image went down like, let's say like another foot or so, and I unraveled the whole thing by hand. And so the, the you know, this material piece of all of this thread coming out to me like reiterates that sense of collapse coming from the top of this, um, this building that's uh, being demolished. Um, this is an image that I took in Cleveland that was somewhat near the studio I had for several years that I was shocked you could walk right inside there. You know, it's like the entire side of this building is open. So I started experimenting uh, more with my processes. Um, this is an image that I hand dyed. Um, so I've been doing some of that, like altering um, the color of some images and uh, I cut away, say like the bottom part of the image that's a black, um, that is actually another piece of fabric. So it's like, um, you know, I get the image, I dyed it, I cut it up, I moved sections around and then attach it to another piece of fabric. So it's, it's very much like thinking about making a collage. It's just using different kinds of materials and tools. So instead of glue, um, I'm using a sewing machine. So this is sewed, sewn together on a machine. Um, I love this image. This was uh, a, an amazing place to see. This is up in Buffalo, New York. So this was an old Wonder Bread factory that um, even the letters had fallen off the sign at the top. So I was working with this also using, um, you know, dye, uh, coloring over the image. I used some bleach and die and it, it ended up with that feeling of almost like one of those sort of um, like hand tinted vintage postcards. Um, and it ended up with a kind of a, a lovely ending, a woman um, who, in, I think her owns a commercial bakery that is down in Youngstown and she bought it and she used it for a, um, a talk that she gave to her employees at the bakery, it's a commercial bakery. I think I've forgotten the name of it, um, sorry. Um, but she said this here, this Wonder Bread building left like this, she said, this will never happen to our business. Our family business will never be this. Uh, so it's kind of a nice story. Um, this is an image I took up in, um, in Detroit um, that, you know, I started moving more into this collage kind of work. Um, 
So it's like basically like um, I took the image and I um, had it woven twice. So it's like a flipped image. And somebody had spray painted or like in graffiti on the side of the building. And I created this thing that almost does feel like, I mean, it feels kind of like an iceberg in a way, you know, where you can see above and below, it feels a bit like a ship um, sailing through clouds and water. Um, this is called Cold Comfort. This is um, a piece I worked on for a really long time of patching together all of these pieces from all of these different cities. So there's like little remnants of um, abandoned buildings from like Youngstown and in Detroit and Buffalo and Cleveland. And, um, you know, thinking back to when people made those, um, you know, or still do of course, quilts that are hanging on a display rod, you know, like it's a very, um, I don't know, beautiful, prideful sort of thing that sometimes people will have in their home. I made something like that out of all of these images with the bottom dropping out of it called cold comfort. Um, this is, um, I showed the image before when I was talking about the abandoned malls. Um, this is the Randall, uh, the Randall Park Mall, you know, when the destruction, you know, demolition was going on. Um, so I tried something really different with this piece of almost making like a panoramic. Um, so this piece is about nine feet wide. So I shot all of these different sequences of photographs, you know, where like standing in the same place and just moving the camera a little bit and then um, sewed them together into making a, you know, a very large piece that was really different. It, it really gave this sense of kind of being able to almost feel like you're like walking into something at that scale. This is a close up of, um, you know, you can see like I've, um, you know, seen together like um, a piece that is from a, you know, if you look closely, you can see that's from a different section of the demolition. So it was piecing together all of these different components of this demolition site. Um, this is another um, scene from this was shot in Cleveland of a whole brick wall, part of it's still standing and the lower part just completely collapsed out. I did um, more um, color work on this one with dye and bleach. This is an image from Youngstown. Um, I just, I cannot tell you how many times I've been out to Youngstown and taken photographs out there. It's just an amazing place. Um, but they're beyond the um, the demolition of buildings or just the decay and abandonment. There's also a place out there that recycles wooden pallets. And uh, there are literally mountains of wooden pallets, you know, stacked up or like there's, you know, this were pallets that were taken apart. Um, and it's really an amazing place to see. Also from Youngstown, there's a lot of abandoned buildings where people, you know, dump tires and trash and, you know, abandoned cars, you name it. Um, this piece I also did a lot of um, hand coloring on and hand work um, of selectively at like uh, regular intervals, pulling out um, threads you can see in that bluish area um, and did this like, you know, a hand tinting. It almost looks like a, sienna toned uh, photograph. This is also Youngstown. Youngstown, there's some buildings that are, um, you know, a little bit higher up on a hill area that still have some, you know, vegetation around. Um, I specifically was going um, to Youngstown like in the in the late fall and early spring. I really liked um, these images of the architecture with like no, no real foliage around, no greenery, just these more um, kind of stark um, vegetation and the way the, the light is at that time of year. Um, this is Detroit. Um, 
this is, um, I'm going to have, I think it's this piece and another piece in a show I, I meant to mention earlier when I was talking about Kyle Meyer. Um, so Kyle and I were in a show um, at Transformer Station, as I mentioned earlier this year, we're going to be in another show, small group show together uh, at the Fuller Craft Museum uh, this fall that uh, Fuller Craft Museum, I think it's in Brockton, Massachusetts, it's somewhat near Boston. So it's it's kind of great to end up in a show twice in a year with somebody who I did not know before and admire so much. I did um, a series of photographs of these abandoned houses in Detroit that everybody's heard so much about that are abandoned and are torched. So this one, they had tried to put up one of those like, um, you know, like little fencing things made out of that like orange plastic um, around this, you know, burned down house. Here's another image from Detroit in the, pretty much that same neighborhood that was just bizarre. It's like this, um, there's this weird siding on this house that is just completely peeled away. It's just like sagging, you know. And, you know, you go through these neighborhoods in Detroit where, you know, there's like empty lots and then there'll be a house like this that's been abandoned for a long time. Then there'll be one little house where a family is still living. You know, you'll see a light on at a barbecue on the front porch. Um, I've also made um, some sculptures out of um, these photographs. So this is a, um, I shot photographs of bricks and of brick walls. Um, that I made into a whole series of like piles of bricks. Some of those are in the show at Shift at the gallery. Um, so this is um, this is the show that was at the Transformer station that I mentioned um, a minute ago. Um, so they um, the Transformer station commissioned me to make a piece for a show. It was titled One. It was like one of a kind um, photograph. So I, you know, made the sculpture um, that still, these are images I took back like 10 years ago when I was in New Mexico. I'd always wanted to do something with these images of the AstroTurf and in, incorporate it with AstroTurf. And um, it was a great opportunity to work with these images. So I had them printed on vinyl, you know, that I felt like correlated to this like weird, almost greasy plastic vinyl like grass. And, uh, you know, and the, um, the, the one on the wall is like mounted and, you know, not framed, but mounted. And the ones draped over, um, you know, this crate or, you know, they're on vinyl that um, has a wonderful kind of like flow to it that just kind of flows across the floor. So I was really happy to get to go back and work with those images. So what comes next? I'm thinking about a couple of different things um, that I'm gonna be working on. Um, I uh, am thinking about vegetation as it takes over um, technology. You know, I've um, been taking some shots of that. i am um, also been thinking a lot about landscape of um, some images that I took during the pandemic and uh, things that I guess you might call like a glitch in the camera that did just weird, strange lighting things. Um, I took a number of pictures during some storms that we had during the pandemic. Um, so I'm kind of um, revisiting, uh, working on some of you know, or not reworking them, but starting new work with these images that I took like maybe last summer and winter. And another um, project that I'm looking at working on developing more is um, I uh, have been a number of times to the um, Ohio Reformatory in Mansfield and um, I don't know if, you know, if you've been there, you should go there. It's amazing. It's horrifying. It was actually, when you go in there, you cannot even imagine that that place was still functioning in 1990 and it was closed by a, a lawsuit that, um, you know, I guess a, that just stated that it was like inhumane, um, dangerously overcrowded. So it closed around 1990 and they relocated all of the, uh, you know, prisoners to other locations, but it, um, 
it's just it's shocking to walk through there. And I've um, been working with these images of walls. Um, there are um, two works in the show at Shift um, that explore that. Um, uh, one is an image um, of a chair. Um, thinking about all the people that got their GEDs, you know, in prison. And uh, another uh, piece in the shift show is a, a locker that's surrounded by, say, the image on the right that has, I mean, to me, that looks almost like a map. Um, uh, I think the piece in the shift show is um, Archipelago. I mean, I, I thought a lot about, like, all of these tiny islands in a way of, of people, you know, of prisoners making up this huge, you know, collection um, of individuals, you know, that are probably barely seen as individuals forming these almost like an archipelago type uh, series of islands. So that is in the shift um, exhibition. Um, and uh, I'm getting near the end with another shout out to the Ohio Arts Council. Um, I've been so lucky to receive um, funding from the Ohio Arts Council through their um, Excellence Award program. So I've um, got another um, award this past cycle, which enabled me to um, get the studio, this new studio fixed up, which is like, I mean, I've had like every studio is amazing and really informs work in some way but I mean I'd been working in a place where the windows were broken and falling in and it was like there was no heat there was no air conditioning it was filthy all the time um I loved it for a couple of years but it was getting pretty old you know not having any heat so this has just been really great and I you know really thank the Ohio Arts Council for their support and really helped me get this place fixed up and this is the last. So, um, you know, if you would like to follow um, what I do or be in touch, I'd love to hear from any of you. Um, so my website is laurendaviesprojects.com. That's the one there on the left with the, the blue image. Um, you can contact me there um, or, you know, some of the works that I've been talking about, if you want to look at them further, they're all there. There's a variety of different projects. And um, I'm pretty busy on Instagram. I love Instagram. I love, you know, taking photos all the time. So the one at the top with it, you know, Cleveland, Canada, Mexico, that is a, an account that just includes everything that's Lauren Davies projects. I post something there every day. Um, the image at the bottom with a picture of the tombstone, that's Lauren Davies projects. I was advised that they needed to start an Instagram account that only included my artwork. So uh, that's that's ex exclusively about the artwork. So um, take a look and be in touch and thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. That's a really wonderful first uh, deep dive into your work and how it's progressed. I love that it gives us a view into the journey of the artist, uh, which is so important. Um, we do have a note from um, a couple of folks. Janice Lipson said, Lauren, your work is so conceptually and visually rich. Thank you. Um, and then from Amy, I love your photography practice. And I'm wondering if you are picking up found materials on your excursions. Um, I would say first, I want to thank Janice. Um, Lipson, I, I've known Janice since a long time ago and have not seen her in many years, but uh, Janice was a wonderful instructor at the San Francisco Art Institute in the film department. So thank you, Janice. Um, Amy, um, I haven't really picked up so much um, as I've just been taking pictures, you know. Um, I don't know, there's this funny um, expression that's used in, you know, the community called Urbex, Urban Explorers. It's like, can't quite remember, it's like, take nothing and leave nothing but footprints, something like that. So that's kind of where I've been. I've just like taken the pictures, you know. Um, but I'm, I spent a lot of time looking at materials um, of thinking about ways of, you know, like I just ordered something this past week of um, thinking about some of these weird like glitch in the camera kind of things, um, of printing those on metal and um, combining them with sculpture. So that's also a thing I'm just starting on right now. 
Uh, we have a note from Honey Lazar. So glad I was able to listen to you today. Been a Cleveland fan for years. Thank you, Honey. I appreciate that. Uh, Christopher Lynn, it's great to hear about your work for the first time. And then Honey also mentioned, yes, Kyle Myers is a swoon. I cried listening to him describe his process this last year. Yeah. Really amazing. Yeah. Breath away. Um, and yeah. thank you for showing your process. So I, I have a question for you that I would love for you to dive into. Um, your work is absent of people. People. <laughs> yeah, but it is not absent of people's impact. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that, that choice? Um, you know, it's one of those things where I never really made a conscientious choice to not have people. But if you even look through my images on my Instagram account, there's rarely ever a picture of a person. Um, I, I think um, the thing that like I evolved into being very interested in is um, how history lives on in the landscape and in architecture. And I, I feel that a lot with the absence of people. You see the residue, the remains, um, yeah, and very specifically the absence of particular people. Um, I think without figures, without people in these images, I think it's much easier to really um, focus and kind of imagine what's happened here, you know. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the issues that I'm interested in, um, I guess, are you know, political sometimes, they're definitely environmental, they're social, they're community issues. I have no answers to any of these things, but they're things that I think about a lot. And I think um, the work that I do, I'm not trying to make it um, an illustration. You know, it's, I'm not trying to be didactic. I'm just trying to say, when I think about this situation, when I'm in this place here, here's how it feels to me. Here's how it looks to me. Um, and I, I don't know, I think maybe it's easier for people to read into that without people, without images of people in the pictures. Uh, Alison Grissetta noted, thank you for the wonderful artist talk. It's been great to hear more about your journey, thinking, and creative process. Oh, thank you, Allison. And I hope for everybody who's here that you will tune in. I think Allison has her talk, is it next week? Uh, September 1st. September 1st. Yes, yeah, so Allison is um, one of the many interesting artists in the show, so I hope you'll all tune in for Allison's talk. I know it's going to be interesting. Uh, and then Janice followed up uh, and said, Lauren, your demolition subject matter brings to mind some of Gordon Mata Clark's work. Does his oh. work interest you? Oh, yeah, right. I, know, I don't know if... Uh, this is when I start feeling my age of a lot of people might not even remember who Gordon Matta Clark is, but he was um, a very well-known artist. And I think it might've been back in the seventies and eighties who worked with, um, he did these, these projects where he would get these houses that were, you know, um, I would assume abandoned. And I'm not really sure how he went about getting these houses, but he split them in half. And if you can imagine like literally sawing a house in two pieces and, and like this gap that would be occurring. But um, I think he died when he was, um, you know, very prematurely, he was quite young when he passed away, but yeah, his work was amazing. I'm also curious, um, Lauren, the, the material you select is also in direct opposition to the material you photograph. So these, Right. It's large weavings are the what standard they would be offered as a blanket, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, a bit of covering and comfort. And so curious if you could chat more about that. Well, I guess when I first started working with the weavings, um, I, I, you know, been making those sculptures I showed a few images of from um, New Mexico. And, uh, you know, it was kind of, that's the first work that I made when I moved to Cleveland. It was just kind of, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, with the weavings, I was just knocked out the first time I ordered one. And, you know, they come, they come from Walmart. You get the little, like, anonymous, you know, envelope. And when I opened it up, I just couldn't believe it. I loved, um, 
I don't know if pixelation is quite the right term, but um, you know, when you look at a weaving, um, actually when I was talking about going way back in time about working at the gallery as a curator, I did a show about the intersection of technology and, um, and fiber arts, which was something I knew absolutely nothing about, but learned about the jacquard um, loom and weaving and that that was really like the forerunner of the computer. It was the forerunner of the punch card, the way those things um, come together. I, um, so I, I, I love that little tiny bitlets that make up an image. Um, and I feel like in some way that kind of reiterates some of what I'm thinking about of all of the tiny moments, all the people that were involved all the time that has passed, that they, all these millions of different little pieces comprise this, this moment that I photographed. Um, I didn't go there looking for that, but it, it did occur to me um, that there is a correlation there. Wonderful. We have a question from Allison again um, regarding working in proximity to um, communities like Detroit that are not your own. And how do you navigate that process of approaching places that have such complex cultural and socio political histories? Well, I have this, um, I'd, I'd gone up to Detroit on my own once or twice and, um, you know, kind of looked around and, uh, you know, I don't know, I can't even remember if I really took many pictures, but then I met somebody um, online, not anything super sexy, but <laughs> um, a guy who had grown up there, but had left there and he was probably around my age. And he said, if you come up, I'll drive you around and show you like all these different things. So, um, so I went up there, he was a super nice guy. He drove me around, I think for like two days. And um, so his whole reference point to everything in Detroit is, this is what this used to be. This used to be this used to be that this neighborhood was like this and that. And, um, you know, and we saw a lot of really interesting things. And he was super patient and like waited for me to take all these pictures. And I kept thinking, well, that's all that that used to be. What is this going to become? You know, um, it's hard to imagine like a city that was that big shrinking, you know, and shrinking and shrinking. A lot of the places that we stopped and looked at, there's like flocks of pheasants that have taken over neighborhoods, you know, where they've torn down all of these houses. So, um, you know, and we saw some really, um, interesting areas where people were doing the urban farming thing. Um, that was really inspiring. Um, you know, I, I watched a lot of, um, not a lot, but some TV documentaries about what had happened in Detroit. And there were these whole other layers of things that I didn't really understand. I think I saw one that was on that uh, point of view uh, uh, TV documentary about how much the Detroit tax system had really um, created this like rapid fire domino effect of all of these things falling and it showed these people coming in and buying up all of these houses and how people that were in their houses were being so overtaxed that they ended up losing their houses. And so they ended up with more and more abandoned houses. It was just, it was very hard to imagine, but um, I you know, didn't really have any connection to anything. Um, beyond um, that person driving me around for two days, um, you know, who was very informative and helpful. I love the way that you are uh, unintended weaving together current and past history and, and trying to reconcile um, our place within it. I think that's great. We, we have a, a note from Karen wondering about the emotional connection to your work. Uh, do you feel this kind of decay was like the wolf at your own door, having lived in the shadows of so much homelessness in California and sense of the impact of pollution and decay in your Rust Belt roots? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I was very, very much wanted to move away from Pittsburgh when I was like a teenager. And I was very fortunate that I could go to California and go to art school and just, you know, like I said, stayed there for 35 years and, you know, had, a, you know, a great life there um, for a long time. And then it was just, like I said, getting 
more and more difficult um, in a variety of ways. But, um, you know, coming back here to the Rust Belt, you know, I um, really thought a lot about my feelings as a kid, you know, like even when I started going to the museum, like that looked like some way more interesting part of life that I felt like I, I was probably 13, that I felt like I wanted to become, you know, which sounds kind of crazy. Um, I, I don't know, even know what I was thinking, but, you know, something about being an artist, something about living in that world of uh, thinking and making. Um, so um, I think getting older and thinking about the economy and all of these things that impact us so much that we really don't have control over, how they can just come like a tidal wave and just sweep over cities and neighborhoods and communities and just pull the rug out from under people, you know? Um, you know, how, how things move on, how all of those jobs left and went to other countries, you know? I mean, in a way, like Pittsburgh um, seemed like they, from what I gather, I mean, even my mother or mother had left there years ago, um, you know, that Pittsburgh seemed to accept pretty early on that the steel industry was over, that was not going to come back. And they started tearing all these steel mills down that were like on the south side of Pittsburgh. And that's become a huge like technology and medical technology, you know, like epicenter. And they, you know, I mean, you still get the, you know, the heavy, Rust Belt vibe there, but you also can see that this is, um, you know, I don't know, a town that really did change and has really um, embraced, you know, medical technology. I mean, I think like Carnegie Mellon and, you know, the University of Pittsburgh and all of the, um, the medical centers that are there have really become very um, predominant, you know, in the identity of Pittsburgh now. But you don't have to go very far outside of Pittsburgh to, which, you know, I go over there fairly often to take pictures and it's, I don't know, I, I'm rambling at this point to answering that question probably. But yeah, the impact of growing up in the Rust Belt and then living in the technology area and leaving there, um, the effect of the economy is something you can't pretend isn't there. I super appreciate the tenderness with which you reflect all of that complexity in your work. Um, and if you all have not had a chance to see it in person, I highly recommend we do have in-person hours. Um, Lauren's work is the kind of work that makes you want to touch it um, because you, you want to use all of your senses possible. There was another thing that happened as we were installing it and uh, doing some work around it. I realized as you get close to the work, because it is um, a weaving, it, it dampens sound. So it changes oh, yeah. the auditory experience within a space too. So yeah. senses are engaged there. Yeah. Um, folks, I I really want to I want to take the moment to thank Lauren Davies for her time and putting together this great artist talk um, and sharing with us all these phenomenal visuals and and the journey with us. Um, and we are really at time, so thank you all for joining us. And thank yeah, you. I really um, appreciate Kat and Amy so much uh, for you know steering this along, and um, you know to Maria, say to Reader, the curator, and to everybody who showed up today, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and to close out, a uh, big thank you to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the governor, and the legislature who all support this great space that allows us to amplify voices like Lauren Davies. Thank you Thanks. so much. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks.